And we're live. What's up, everyone? My name is Dr. Prodigy. Welcome to GSM Live. I'm joined here by uh, Degas, otherwise I call him Kendall. Kendall, uh, it's all good. <laughs> uh, DJ, <laughs> and of course, the one and only Nine Swole Grains, aka Nine Whole Grains. Thank you for joining us uh, this week, Nine. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So we're just going to go ahead and get right into it because, you know, there's nothing really else to say. So uh, the first topic for today that we're going to discuss is uh, the Invitational, which finished up, um, what was it, two weekends ago? Uh, mm -hmm. Happened two weekends ago. So 16 of the top teams were invited to compete in Ink TV's Invitational. Um, and then the first day was round robin, round robin groups of four. Second day was top cut, um, finalizing into the, the the winner of their of their second invitational. Um, and I'm actually going to start with DJ. What are your thoughts about uh, the outcome? You know, the winner being FTW. Thoughts on top eight? Just any general comment? Um, FTW definitely stepped it up big time. Uh, I don't think anybody really predicted them to be first place. You know. Maybe some people predicted them high, but I think a lot of people were going to be, it's going to be KP or Ghost, because EU, lol. So definitely good on their end. Um, you know, Back Squids did pretty well, too. Uh, I guess it was kind of expected because they've been doing well recently, but, you know, it's kind of nice to see them do it. Overall, that's basically what I got. It was fun commentating, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you did commentate, didn't you? Oh, it was yeah, uh, you and Hero, right? And then you also subbed in for nine too. Yep. Yeah, he did a great job. It was awesome. I love I love watching you guys uh, commentate together and work together like you did. It's I was we, actually we need the first more DJ commentary. We need more mm -hmm. DJ commentary. That was actually the first time commentating with Walkie. Weirdly enough, Wait, it worked. Yeah, it you worked. used to commentate a lot more in Splatoon One, didn't you? But you haven't really been doing that as much for I, two. I haven't commentated online tournaments in a long time since okay. Splatoon Two came out. So, so it's been less in general because of that. But I've commentated, I think, every LAN I've gone to. So, other than being woken up by your commentary, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> so my my bedroom's right next to his room that he commentates in. So I just yeah. woke up from him getting hype. I'm just like, oh god. And the cat can the cat can open the door. So like he'll just yeah. like <laughs> decide to open the door, and then it's just like me shouting into the room, basically. So it's great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, what about you, Nan? What are your thoughts of the invitational? I'm a, like, like DJ was saying, I think FT win winning and especially how dominant the grand finals looked. I'm just happy to see FT win back where they were before, you mm -hmm. know, the disbandment and everything happened there. They made the video that they were a real team and then they went away and they really hadn't like, they'd played well, don't get me wrong, but like they weren't right. quite the same level. So to see them finally get back up to where they were capable of was, uh, I mean, that was really, really nice to see from them. And then uh, on top of that, the Ghost Gaming versus Kraken Paradise losers final set was mm -hmm. legendary. Like that's that's the set that I've been directing people when they want to know what top Splatoon looks like. That's the set I've been showing them because you know four three two rivals. So I mean the Invitational was what we all hoped it would be. You get yeah. a format that benefits the teams to get as many good matches as we can. We got to see some good upsets in a. Uh, I guess pseudo upsets. I was not expecting low key to beat back squids. Um, and they did. So, I mean, when you get a format like that and run as well as they did, it just went really well on all accounts, uh, minus my internet. But everything else, everything <laughs> right. else was good. Yeah, there was actually some really cool like storylines going on. I mean, first of all, it was NA winning an event while well, Nine showing off his sweet year. Here. Jenny told me to, so. Uh, <laughs> um there's some interesting storylines because not only with na winning a big you know online event um for the first time in quite a while i think um that in of itself is significant but uh keo was apparently had like the flu the entire time it was like really super Everybody sick the jordan game yeah, yeah. i i oh, i specifically was i told him on saturday night i was like if you guys end up like winning this like i'm gonna call you the michael jordan of splatoon and he, he loved it and then, that of course, was you guys said that statement yeah, I said it. I said that. <laughs> I said that to him Saturday night. That's probably why and they won. Maybe. I hope so. He's like, I gotta be called Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> um, and then afterwards, once I saw they were in grand finals, I started hitting up people. It's just like, hey, who's good to Photoshop? And I'm like, let's make this happen. <laughs> I'm really very rushed. Photoshop Photoshop of, 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 like, of like somebody holding him like with his face and, photoshopped on it. Yeah. 
so it was the it was a picture cool. of Michael Jordan like sitting there with like all of his rings on his hand. And <laughs> no, it was no, no, no. I got a picture then... for you later. I got <laughs> okay. a picture for you later, and you have to use this picture. Okay, it's and then up because the only pi- the only picture of the only like relatively good picture of Keo that I could find was actually him in bed while he was sick. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so it was, it, I I just you know I just found what I could find. I gave it to the guy that was helping Pixel help me make it, and it was like a very just like rush, like let's just have this ready as soon as it's you know as soon as they win, if they win type of thing. But That's yeah, that was <laughs> it was hysterical. But what about what about you, Kendall? What did you think of uh, the uh, Invitational? This, you know, this is the first one I actually got to like sit down and like watch it because usually I'm at church, so um, mm-hmm. this one I actually like sat down, got to watch it. Uh, the, fl- the first one I didn't get to watch, obviously. So now this is the first one that I actually got to watch and just watching, like, you know, everything that transpired with. First, I have to say, Ink TV does an amazing job with this whole thing. It's like almost kind of watching a land with how mm-hmm. much work they put into everything. Obviously, like, you, Spoon's told me before, I know he doesn't work with it as much um, now, but like before about everything that, like, gone into and how much work they put it into it. Like, All right. So it was just like amazing kind of watching it and like getting see, to see everything transpire. Also on top of that, it's kind of like, you know, NA with uh, Feed to Win. Um, it's kind of cool seeing them like, you know, like they vanished and then they kind of came back and it was like, there's like tremors of them coming back, you know, like working with each other. And now it's kind of like, okay, now they're getting back into their strides, seeing them taking on a team like Kraken Paradise because it's just like, oh, Kraken Paradise won again. Ghost. Okay, they 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 went on their like crazy like losers like run all the way up and they 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 wanted this time again. So it's kind of like crazy just seeing them, you know, like coming back and being able to like be like, yeah, we're still kind of good at this game. And yeah, we still could potentially dominate. <laughs> kind of. Let me so, got the Michael Jordan or Splatoon out of your team, but just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like so it's, it's just kind of really like just seeing the narrative and like the story just like re- pop up again. Hopefully, like we can see them continue on. It, it stays as, as a consistent thing, a consistent thing because it's yeah. kind of great just for the scene in general. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed everything from like the pr- production. We all know we talk about Black and how yeah. how he does with everything in that aspect. So um, from just how it's ran, stream uh, sets, absolutely amazing. Uh, and just even looking at like the bracket, I was just like, oh wow! Like you saw that certain teams put up a more, put up a fight against certain teams that you didn't think they would. So. It was it was definitely interesting. Yeah, I think FTW is really a good definition of a redemption arc, right? You know, they they were kind of you know at the very beginning of the team back. What was it? Was it? I always I can never remember what it was called. It was like Inkstorm or something like that. I I forget what Inkstorm Cup. Summer Inkstorm Cup. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So like they were. I Deep Blues at the time was scrimming them a lot as they were practicing for that, and I remember thinking like, holy crap! Like these guys are like insanely good all of a sudden, like out of nowhere. Like these Mm. these it's one of those it's one of those things where it's like you get a certain group of four together and then everything just like kind of clicks almost kind of like the original like dead beats back in the day where you just get that four there and just like everything just click and i remember thinking like i honestly think these guys have a chance to like pull this off and of course they ended yeah. up going undefeated and winning it all and then they a lot not of drop a game or something yeah, i think they didn't it was drop a game in that event yeah mm-hmm. it was insane and then of course there was un- some unfortunate circumstances afterwards yada 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 you know, and some other stuff happened and, you know, we didn't hear from them for very much for a while. And like they were playing, but it's like they weren't really like taking things like super seriously. They were always playing with like different like subs and stuff like that <laughs> and BNSs or you'd have like a couple of them playing together and the other couple like subbing for different teams. It just seemed like they weren't like ready to like take things seriously again. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they decide, let's do it again. I don't I don't know. Maybe this was something that was planned. I don't really know what brought it all together. Um, but I, I think from what I understand, come roaring back. I think from what I understand, it has a lot to do with, it, with Shaq practicing regularly again. Mm-hmm. I think for like four months there, he basically couldn't practice as much as like the team needed him to. And like when he's playing well, they do well, mm-hmm. you know, not saying like he's the one carrying the team, but he, like he's kind of like that right, glue yeah. that kind of keeps them, you know, move, like moving together and being the team that they are when they play like they do at Invitational. So. I could see that. I could see that being the case. I don't. I, again, I don't. I, like I said, I don't know if that's the case for sure, but I could definitely see that happening. Mm-hmm. All I one have to say that, is, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. You got it. I was just going to say one thing that was a little disappointing is um, for Team Undecided the fact that Shura couldn't be there for day two, and they had to oh, find right. a sub for that. Mm-hmm. That I think 
you know, that could have changed the entire dynamic of the of the tournament. And it's just kind of sad to see one of day one's best teams not really get to come out and play the same. I mean, they still almost beat back squids. So like they were still clearly a right. formidable team. But um, seeing them them beat Ghost and the level they were playing at, I was a little disappointed that we didn't get to see that in day two. But, you know, what can you do? That reminds me, actually, um, going off of this thought, Kendall, you can I know you were trying to say something earlier, but no, no, go ahead. Um, the idea that we're finally having a Japanese team or mostly Japanese team invited to compete like, you know, they've been they've been around for the BNSs. And that's one of the big reasons why they got an, you know, an invite to the Invitational, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is the first time where we've actually had like more teams outside of, you know, just NA and EU be invited to participate. And there's actually been interest in, in participating. Um, what do you guys think about that? Do you think that's a good thing, bad thing? You know, is it is it something that we want to have? I mean, we had uh, t- Japanese teams around in Splat One, like Memories, and right. uh, yeah, I forget. The but it's been names, a while, but it's been it's, a while. Yeah, there, there's like a eight month ga- eight month gap, but I think part of that might be because maybe the Japanese scene is lo- slowing down a little bit. Maybe not quite as many things going on over there. Um, but I think a part of it too is they don't, as far as I understand, they don't have the money prize pools like we do. So mm. I think I think they kind of see that and are like, hmm, free money. So, <laughs> I forget. <laughs> oh, dang. <laughs> I mean, free money. That's that's good. Uh, I also think that it's only a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's a culture and just a mega, a Splatoon powerhouse over there. And the more that we tap into that and the more that we bring in those resources, the better. I mean, I think I tweeted about this a while back, but in terms of like the account being followed, Splatoon is, I think, number five in the world. The yeah, Splatoon JP friendship. account has yeah. over 1 million followers on Twitter. And in terms of like tags and whatnot, Splatoon is a top 10, top yeah. 10 there too. So like the game yeah. has worldwide potential, like mm-hmm. giant star potential. So even the smallest crossover, I think is, is I mean, that's, that's good tidings at least, if nothing else. And if like Japanese viewers like start coming over and watching our Twitch channels and it's, are like... Or like watching our tournaments and being like, oh, I'm going to root for the Japanese team. Oh, dude's cool. Oh, Ghost is cool. You know, like all these other teams that they see and they're like, and they start following them as well. Even if they don't really understand the language, it's like, it's just more people, more, more eyes on the game in, in the yeah. Western scene, even if they're not from the West. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. What about you, Kendall? Um, all I was going to say is it's big because of the fact that you get to see like different play styles. Um, majority of us, like I, I did probably maybe uh, DJ and... Uh, prodigy maybe you guys actually like go on like open rec and stuff like that but uh for the most part like i feel like most na players or even watch people that watch know nothing about the japanese scene so i mean the more cross like division you have between the two you get to see like what they run what they're what they're what weapons they're playing how they're looking at the game and like the different approaches that they take so it's a it's a big opportunity if, if more players would come through no matter like obviously it's not like the the best the best is coming out, but still, like it's just another different like mindset in the game. Also, again, as you guys already brought up, um, it's just tapping into a a big resource that like if they looked at it, if if we were able to like you know like get more tournaments going with them, it'd be huge just for the scene in general. So mm-hmm. it's a good thing. Yeah, I think so too. I definitely think it caught a lot of people off guard though. Is the fact that you have this team whose name was undecided. And their logo was literally a meme of like, I want you to choose our team name. It like it came across as kind of like a big joke, which with Tic Tac being on the team and being yet again another Tic Tac pickup. I'm, you know, we we've called them out before for this. Just like, bro, like, come on. Um, I think I think it it came across as a little bit of a joke. I think, which it's like it's fine. It was like lighthearted. They don't mean anything by it, but um. I th- I think there was some initial response that was kind of like what the heck, and then once they saw them play, and especially once they beat Ghost, everyone's just like, holy cow! Like, okay, this is sweet. Like, this is awesome. Um, and I I think it's good. Hopefully, hopefully that'll continue. Hopefully, seeing um, you know, this team compete will c- promote other Japanese teams to get interested. Especially again, like you mentioned, like DJ mentioned, like the money. It's if I do believe that is correct that there isn't much of a money. Uh, funding available to them. They're, they're, they're supported in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'd be really cool to see. Um, I think the last thing I want to mention about the Invitational, um, some of you guys already touched on it before, is like just the overall production quality was top-notch. Um, yeah. you know, we, we here at GSM, me, me, DJ, and Kendall, 
you know, we took a lot of pride with our Long Island Splat and our Beacon events and moving into Long Island Summer Splat of each each event, trying to push, you know, push the production level up and up. Trevor is, you know, a huge help from Gen Game with that. Um, and so, like, we really wanted to really help push that. And, you know, and, and uh, EGTV helped us get started on, on that regard, too, giving us some pointers and stuff. So it's really nice to see Invitational, again, pushing the bar, trying to move that production level up higher and higher. I think that's really cool. And hopefully we can you know, keep, keep raising that bar, um, big ups to all those people that put in a ton of work mm-hmm. for all that stuff. Yeah. Very fortunate that Jack hates sleeping more than any individual I've ever <laughs> met in my life. Great. Seriously. Awesome work to Jack. And yeah, like you said, everybody there, but I don't know. TikTok might want to have a word with you on that. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, that's the Invitational. Moving on, let's talk about the U.S. Inkling Open Top 8, which, of course, just happened yesterday. So a very, very um, fresh uh, event. Uh, see, the, the matches were What versus Element R, um, Ink Sigma versus Low Key, um, FTW versus Upgrade, and Demise versus Luminous C. Um, what low key demise and FTW being the winners? Um, so what do you, what do you guys think of the outcome? Do you think this was expected, unexpected? Any, anything that caught you guys off guard? Uh, I'll start. I'll start with you, Kendall. Um, pretty sure that everybody. Maybe you could have put up a top toss up between like you could have been like maybe Luminous C could have done a little bit more to like possibly win, but that would have been my top four if I was to like pick. Definitely. Um, so I'm not really surprised uh, in that regard. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, besides that, like, if we're just talking about, like, wh- who would have won out, that's about it. Like, I really think that's, I, coming into it, I don't think there would have been any change. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Nine? You're shaking your head. Well, I was just saying, I was shaking my head in agreement, which is weird to say, but I mean, they were the top, <laughs> they were the top four seeded teams to begin with. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, and this is the second year in a row the top four seeded teams have finished top four in the North American Inkling Open. And those four teams are comprised of mostly the same players over the course of the two years, too. So, Except for Loki, I remember. Well, right, right. right. Yeah, Loki, Loki got upset last year by uh, Vitamin C, actually. That yep. was uh, who knocked them out of the top eight when they were still Prophecy at that point. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think the end result isn't... A surprise to anybody i think most people are aware that there is you know that there is another tier and you know due to a number of reasons some teams getting knocked out a little early we weren't able to see maybe the quality of matches that we wanted to in the end um mm-hmm. but i will say uh, a couple of sets that i found very enjoyable i found all of them enjoyable because i got to cast them but uh, <laughs> i really thought that the um low-key splatoon versus ink sigma set was a lot closer than the final like score will show you okay. uh they were winning so they were the game that arashi dc'd ink sigma was winning at that point anyway and then they were about one inch and one spray from <laughs> the one's umbrella away from winning the rainmaker game too so i think that like that was actually a pretty close set so i was encouraged by that and then i thought that uh luminous c and demise was the classic the the classic case of the close four one where yeah. like all of the games were good because I think Luminous C had the lead in four of the five games at one point, and then Demise just had the composure. So, all, right. um, all in all, it was a lot of fun. People will make what they will of the compositions, but I thought it was fun because I got to explain and try to figure out like why that would be to the audience. Um, so that was kind of nice, and so I, I enjoyed it. Um, pretty expected, but you know, sometimes expectations can still be fun. Um, and then DJ. Um, I mean, yeah, def- what the other said, it's, it wasn't really a surprise. I think, I think the main surprise was just how dominant most of those sets were. Like some of them were like, you know, close four O's, but there were still four O's, you know? So like people were right. just kind of like, ah, oh, I didn't get to see anything super good clutch and hype, but it's like, this isn't really meant to be the spot where it's, you know, clutch and hype. That's going to be at PAX. That's why they're going to PAX. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm maybe I would maybe say I'm a little disappointed that because it could have been more interesting. But you know, it's just the nature. Like it's just the nature of how it kind of worked out. Um, like part of that is because 
you know we're about to get the band turf war um, no no, no, no. <laughs> it, i'm not i'm not I'm gonna hate on turf war as much as i'm gonna hate on like like it's not their fault because they had 500 teams but a mm-hmm. single a limb turf war tournament is just asking to have some weird things happen when you get close to the top you know what i mean like top 16 top eight that's like no matter what there's going to be teams that like really don't make sense there um in a normal scenario or teams it's that like madness, kind man. of the, the teams that kind of like if they had a second chance to bounce back they would you know easily do it kind of stuff um mm-hmm. you know <clears throat> i don't know that there's an answer to it because of how much time it would take to do much of anything else maybe some sort of pools format but i don't know if they could even organize that so you know it's yeah, just I, it, it's just it's just like uh you know there's no perfect way to solve that problem that's actually something i want to expand on because I, I believe nine touched on that too i think his quote was something along the lines of not seeing the matchups we might have seen in top eight because of some of the upsets that happened in the turf war rounds mm-hmm. um is that something so we, we did talk about this in the last show but i think this is still a very interesting topic especially after seeing how the matches played out yesterday um is is there this idea that turf warrior is not the best judgment of skill of you know of of of, of, the, of these teams or something maybe maybe that might be the wrong way to phrase it um this idea that we didn't see the matches that we thought we should have seen was that influenced by turf war um, do you guys think do you guys think that's a fair thing to say? And if so, is there a way that we could try to make that not happen anymore? Oh, I think one hundred percent you can say that it was affected by turf war. I mean, yeah. there's no question. It's, yeah, it's not it's, even a it's question. one of the most inconsistent <laughs> modes. But I also think that you like you look at what Nintendo is trying to accomplish with this tournament, and mm-hmm. they understand it. Like the game labels one of them competitive and one of them not. And <laughs> Like, I think that, yeah, I don't think there's any question, but I also think that one of the goals of the format is to create the results that we saw. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that's part of what they want to do. You look at the Smash Bros. Invitational as well. Mm -hmm. They've made that format to showcase to all audiences what the game is. And the vast majority of people who play this game play Turf War. Yeah, the lag hindered more than the, the items itself. But yeah, yeah, that well, you know, okay. we're not we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. Tournament. We're not talking about this tournament. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think it automatic. Like anytime you see, like a a not top eight where the seeds are top eight, something changed and something happened. Um, so yeah, I think it certainly affected it. And I don't say that to like take anything away from the teams. Everybody signed yeah. up. The sets went game five. It was clearly a close close battle between two closely matched teams. But yeah. I don't think you can even argue the other way. Yeah, I think mm. for me personally, some some things that, that take into effect is that they do their seeding based off of tournaments that, that don't include Turf War because we don't have Turf War tournament, right? So that inherently kind of does create a biased seeding when you are only playing the mode that there is no seeding based off of for the first significant portion of the tournament. Um. So whether that's a justification for having more turf war tournaments, justification for trying to change how the seating works, I don't really know. I don't really have an answer for that, but I think that is an interesting kind of thought uh, to think about. <clears throat> and additionally, I, I honestly like turf war. It has its flaws, but it really isn't like the end all be all. Like it really could work, and I think maybe if there was more of a practice environment for turf war and more of a reason incentive to practice turf war, we could continue to see some really interesting things happen. Um, in, in a competitive sense of how that could be developed. That's but, what I was going to ask. I don't know if you guys hit it last week because that, that was one of my notes, by the way, mm-hmm. um, is like if I was to ask you, Prodigy, like obviously you're you're the coach of your team. How much did you think like you practice for like when did you start practicing even for like the invitation uh, for like turf war? For, for the U.S. Open? We As soon as it was Sorry, announced. Turf, yeah, yeah. As soon as it was out, as announced, we tried to do turf war only scrims for leading up to that granted it was only two weeks we only had two weeks between announcement to like playing if i remember correctly it was like two to three weeks something like that i I don't Um, know like don't get me i'm gonna play devil's advocate like here like i'm i'll let you know straight up i'm one of those people i actually don't believe that i feel like obviously it's nintendo fine do whatever you want but like community nah but since we know that nintendo's coming around every single year and you know every single year that nintendo's gonna come around and be like yo turf war what you guys do (laughs) <laughs> and we, you're playing turf war 
I don't care what you think. Just like no matter if there is going to be a Smash tournament, there is going to be items and you're going to have to do it. So like, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's up to like the community itself to be like, all right, yo, Nintendo has this crazy thing that's going to happen. We're going to have to play Turf War. It's going to be like basically survival of the fittest, basically whoever can understand how to do Turf War the best or not get screwed over by trying to sandbag the whole entire time. Maybe we should try to like, you know, like, like hit up BNS, hit up like other tournaments and be like, yo, month straight, two months straight, like, yo, literally, let's just grind out Turf War. Mm -hmm. And it might actually like help out for like those, those instances where like you have that situation where like you don't know what you're doing in this situation. Because a lot of teams it did happen to, not just you guys, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and not, not, not other teams, but like a lot of people just don't understand it. Who plays it? Like, Mm -hmm. You go in there every once in a while, maybe, and you play it on Splatfest. Nobody like thinks about like what team comps it, top comp is the best. I don't. I don't think anyone in North America, at least that I know of, goes into Turf War with a set group of four saying, "Let's practice Turf War." If if it's just if anyone's playing Turf War, it's usually by themselves, not as like a team exactly. Unit. So I mean, if you like, especially with like Nintendo, I mean, I'm not saying like there's. It's not as bad as playing with items in Smash. Like, that's obviously... <laughs> you keep going back to that. <laughs> it's super out there. Like, I'm just bringing up, like, what Nintendo does. Like, what Nintendo right. does. Like, but it's a mode that they're going to keep pushing every single time. They do it in Japan. Like, the same thing. Um, so, I mean, it's something that I feel like a month before or two months before when you know that it's going to come around, just, like, start forcing yourself to play it. Like, just get used to, like, just get used to the pressure. Because, like, even though, like the, like, the top teams that are at the top... They still made it through. Well, like nothing stopped them. I guess my question is, why does it got to be turf war only? Like, if you're gonna showcase the game, why not showcase the whole game? You know what I mean? Like, because the people that are watching play turf war. Yeah, but you could have turf war as game two and four, and one, That's three, true. and five is the other modes. Like, I don't know. I don't. I just don't see why it has to be one or the other. And why can't, like, if they have to have Turf War included, why not just make it included, not exclusive? Because then mm -hmm. by the time, because, like, if we're switching over to Turf War not at all for top eight and top four, is that defeating the point? You know what I mean? Like, no, there was no, no way that they were going to have as many people watching that um, initial stage as they do in the, you know, the, the top eight stage and the top four stage. And they're not going to play Turf War at either of those, right? So where's, where's the, Where's the logic well, the top there? Four, they're going, they're usually, well, just going back for the top four, even like from last year when they go into the, the World Cup or whatever, they, they did Turf War for the, the beginning of it. They do they so did like a just, tur one game of Turf War round robin to do seeding for the finals, but it's not an actual okay. impact on the result. So, right. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't see why they have to be so mandatory about Turf War on the early stage and then not included at all in the final stage like i i'm happy that they're at least putting the ranked modes in at the finals but i just i just don't get where the logic line is for them it's hard to say for sure that's there it, it is kind of thinking about it trying to form some sort of like cohesive okay maybe they went with this step and like like following like a train of logic or a certain path of logic you, i can't really figure it out i do kind of agree with that um I, I guess the only thing I could potentially think of is the fact that when you first purchase the game, you can't play the ranked modes. Like you have to get to a certain level. And even then, you have to, after that, then you have to get to a certain rank in the ranked modes to be able to search with your friends. So there's kind of already these barriers inserted into the game when you, you just when you first start playing it, that maybe that's what they're kind of going for to show like you can, you know, you introduce you to all this turf war. And then maybe after a while, you go, after watching it, go, okay. I get it. Like I know what's going on, and then all of a sudden you're just like, ah, oh, but but wait, there's more. And then like you got all these ranked modes, like splat zones, tower control, all that stuff. It's so, like maybe that way that's what they're trying to go for because you know, admittedly, these tournaments have been also like a marketing esque tournament type of thing. Like these aren't like here's like ten thousand dollars for the first team. It's you know, like they, it's it's a really cool event. Don't get me wrong, and it is it is a competitive event. But at the end of the day, I think from Nintendo's standpoint is that it's going to help us market the game. So. Maybe from that standpoint, but like honestly, outside of that, I can't really think of any other rationale. So, it, you know, maybe it's something that will continue to develop, and maybe they will eventually either include the other modes earlier on or have turf war included in you know the the top eights. But it's it's kind of in this weird in between 
And it feels like as a player of someone that has played as, as long and has watched the game as much, it definitely feels like there's a little bit of a disconnect um, just because Turf War just isn't as developed as the rest of the modes because we as a community basically said that Turf War isn't worth developing. Um, whether we have to revisit that, again, I don't know, but there, there just feels like there's that disconnect there. I mean, I, I guess it's kind of just like easing people in to like competition. I, I don't know, like it's maybe they see it as a way of like the entrance to like getting into like competitive Splatoon and that's kind of their way of looking at it. Like maybe people won't sign, maybe they think people won't sign up if they don't put Turf War in it. So, right. yeah. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, but that's still, I mean, why is it Turf War only? You know, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. I get the thought process of where you're coming from, but I feel like they think that like there's some type of merit i think it, it i think it's more just, just about we don't want to think about it so turf war only guys sorry mm, the logistic mm. the logistic side yeah i think plays okay. a part in it for sure okay um moving on to some other <clears throat> topics with about the the us open the the production and having the casting live i think was really really cool um, nice. Nina, obviously you were involved again yeah. Is there anything that you want to touch on or talk about any of any of your experiences you would like to share uh just i it's it's always encouraging to uh, get to talk with people who are outside of the Splatoon community about Splatoon. And of mm -hmm. course, those of you who watch knows that it was, I mean, it was a Nintendo doubleheader and they made very sure that we pushed the idea of the event as a Nintendo doubleheader. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always just cool to talk to people outside of Splatoon, in this case, Vicky and Toph and D1 and some of the other commentators who were there about the game itself and hear how they view it. Um, the casting, I thought, you know, I thought I did a pretty good job um, sifting through what was some, you know, just uh, some some interesting matches. So that was cool. But really, the main point is, like, people outside of Splatoon love Splatoon more than people who play Splatoon. <laughs> <laughs> I have, okay. I, I have never, saying. like, like people... I get people, what you're saying. And it, well, I mean, it's, and it's like that, let me be frank, it's like that in every game, right? Yeah. You can say a game sucks, but only when you have played and continue to play and are hopelessly addicted to that game. But it's just always refreshing to be able to take a step outside of that and see how other people who aren't in our game view it. And so that's really all I have to, to say about that. Um, Jordan and Ashley are fun to work with, as always. We had mm -hmm. earpieces in, and it was just, it was a good time. <laughs> it always is. Good. I'm glad you had a good time. It's 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 really nice seeing. Um, we're starting to now get kind of the same faces for 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 these events, right? And so yeah. you kind of you're able to see these uh, faces that we really only get to see together at Nintendo events, and to watch them develop, and you kind of see them understand and learn more about the game that we all that we all love, um, and be able to see that being shared and developed on you know a bigger stage is for me really cool to see. Um, something that I wanted to ask is, you know, especially since you do have that, the mingling of some of the Smash commentators there and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, this topic of how much there is to practice with Splatoon, especially with the rule set being ran, like essentially all maps available, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta know how to play the game and come up with stuff on the fly. Cause there's 23 maps, um, mm -hmm. versus the Smash rule set, which is a little bit more restricted in what maps are available, which granted doesn't change the game that much, but does to an extent. And, you know, again, they had they did have items on for a significant portion of their tournament as well. Was there any discussion about how the sheer amount of knowledge that you guys have to, like, kind of understand? Like, for example, when a Clash Neo comes out of nowhere, it's like, do these do does everyone? Know, oh, yes, that has these, you know, has the sub has the special. Here's what they're trying to do with this weapon. Like, you know, these stuff that we don't normally see very often. Does, is there is there just like the sheer the sheer amount of stuff that you need to know to actually be able yeah, to understand the game that almost verbatim um some of them like that's actually a conversation that was had because you know they would ask me like how how in the world you keep track of all of these things and understand the power positions of like here or here or what it is and all these different weapons um and that's they were very um very just they had tons of positive reinforcement and they were very complimentary towards uh just splatoon commentary and things like that. And there was actually, I forget who it was, but somebody tweeted after Genesis, after it finished, uh, if Splatoon commentators ever decide to do Smash, we're done for. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't retweet that, but I, I liked it. Uh, you should have. I want to retweet it now. Come on. <laughs> See, that's why I didn't want to do it, though. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's really hard. There's so much minutia that Smash commentators have to know that I think it kind of evens out. But yeah, that is one of the reasons why commentating this game is so hard. 
and why you have to be literally thousands of hours versed in it to really yeah. There's a to lot. really like keep track of everything. And that was one of the things that the commentators like who, and just smashers in general I talked to about this game say. They say like how in the world do you guys keep track of all of those things and then still play the mechanical game? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, because we're all freaking fiends and have thousands of hours in the game. Uh, exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. there's no other there's no other alternative. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of legacy skill from the people in Splatoon 1 as well. Like some people will say, yeah, I've got 2000 hours in Splatoon 2. You add that to the 1000 hours you had in 1, that's now 3000 hours. Like that's so much. And it's yeah. not even <laughs> half of what like Keo has in Splatoon 2 alone. Yeah. Like I, we, you know, know. kids at like 6000 hours or something something like that. Yeah, right one now. for like, one for each ring. Wait, no, is that, is that confirmed? One. He was there 5 thousand this summer, so he's got to be at like six thousand or something. What? I think um the either the blaster player or the brush player from the the, the Japanese team that's been uh, playing in BNS has over has over ten thousand. They they've they've maxed what? it out. They just leave the game on twenty four seven. That's yeah, the they, they, they turn they turn their sleep option off on their switch and it's just, it's just but yeah, I checked it. It was at you know over nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine hours. They maxed out in the count. That is absurd. Yeah, it, it's no. it's insane. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. How? And we wonder why we're not as good as Japan. <laughs> right? Ten? Ten? Yeah. Ten no. thousand hours. Yeah. That's I'm like at, I'm not, not even at two thousand in Splatoon two, I don't think. I think I'm at like yeah. fifteen hundred or sixteen hundred, but Yeah, around the Dang dude, same. that's crazy. That's mm -hmm. so crazy. Yeah. So wow. it's it's interesting that people like again, I just kinda wanna wrap up this thought. It's it's interesting that people that don't play the game as much as we do still understand like holy crap there really is like just so many different variables i mean just look at yeah. you know just map mode combinations alone 23 times four if you want to do the ranked modes and then times five if you want to do turf four like even 100 plus maps. yeah <laughs> it's crazy then, you yeah. can do the math on how many weapon compositions we exactly. i know yeah. i know <laughs> i don't i don't want to do the math on that it's and then and then gear don't forget gear yeah and then yeah, there's tons. So uh, they were just very respectful. And, you know, everyone who I talked to about Splatoon, who's just watched it really enjoys, really enjoys the idea from it. And I'll tell you what I heard a lot at Genesis when I asked people, oh, well, then why don't you play it? They almost always said, oh, you know, I played it a little bit. And it was just it was just too hard, man. I couldn't keep going. Like I got to some of them will say like, yeah, I got to a rank or I got to B plus rank. And, you know, I was feeling pretty good, but yeah. it's just too hard of a game. And then I think of like how we view the game. And sometimes you forget, like, we're like, man, X rank players are so bad, or God, you're only <laughs> and here are these people saying, yeah, I got to A rank, and it was and just, just, you know, it's just too hard of a game. And it's like, oh, yeah, just perspective. And it's just, it's so cool to see that. I'm not like trying to make any grand statement, but it's just cool. I mean, it's yeah. cool to see from other people. I think, I well, think it is important, though, to have that outside perspective from time to time. Go ahead, uh, Kendall. No, I was just going to say, well, you forget that the average player probably is around like A rank. I think I remember when like TK Breezy was streaming the game like consistently for a little bit. He was like around like A, but he was using the Octobrush, so it was an unforgivable <laughs> sin. So, Whoa. yeah. Whoa. Um, I mean, the other part of that is like, you know, coming from a fighting game to a shooter game, it's like yeah, totally that's, yeah, different. That's a huge difference. Yeah. So it's like if they tried to go and like get pro at Halo, it's like, uh, well, you know, maybe that's not that easy for me to do. There's, there's a certain set of skills that are yeah. a it's, little bit You different. can transfer from similar games to similar games fairly easily, but when, you're when you've been playing Melee and Brawl and Smash 4 only for the past 10 years, and you're like, ah, oh, now I'm going to play Splatoon, man, it gets hard at B+. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. All right, so, uh, so to wrap up uh, the U.S. Open, we now have our four teams that are being flown out to PAX East, which is in of itself amazing that's really really cool a great opportunity hope all those teams are able to enjoy themselves um but what are you guys' predictions for the top four at pax east i'll you start said right man. there what uh, <laughs> i oh, you know wow. you, got, you got me you got i am me. i think that uh You're going what wow i am going what you know i love i love everybody on ft win i think we're going to see some great matches but i'm going with the experience and i'm going with the i i i trust Penget with my life Okay, <laughs> if I were falling off of a burning bridge and I could choose one person from the community, I would choose you, Kendall, because you're really strong. But <laughs> Ping, it, Ping it would be on the list. Uh, Ping it would be on the list. I just think, again, Steady having that experience, three of the four of them have competed at Nintendo lands in front of lots of people. And I do think like 
people talk about the land effect, and I think that's a little exaggerated. Mm. The national land effect mm. on Nintendo, that I think is mm. a big, big, big deal. And I think that uh, just having the experience. Now, fortunately for FT Win, they do have Kyo. Kyo competed at E3 last year, so he's got that. And he's also Kyo uh, outside of the land part of it. But I'm going with what? I'm going with them until they lose. Okay. DJ? Um. I think it comes down to how much sleep Tic Tac gets beforehand and uh, whether or not <laughs> Hangit forgets his switch in Alabama or somewhere in Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah. So, well, I, like, the, do they get to play on the switches? They're all great, but they, nobody but, like, nobody but Tic Tac has really been grinding the, com, like, the game competitively mm. in the last, like, six months since basically since STDX disbanded. So, like, yes, they're all very good. They're all very experienced, but with way, FT Win's been playing lately, and with the fact that, you know, Fuzzy's kind of been just in the Japan world, uh, Aust- like, Pengit has, you know, he's always been good, but he's also been doing just school for the past, like, five months, so it's like, he'll, he'll come back for a couple weeks here and there, but that's basically all he's been doing, being able to do. And then, you know, um, wait, why am I not remembering the fourth right now? Oh, power. Power is always good, oh. so... <laughs> I, I think, like, Kia, I would call me Kia the Michael Jordan of Splatoon, but if I had to think of just, like, a consistent powerhouse, no matter what he's doing, it's, like, power. Yeah. Like, it, I, it's ever since he yeah. hit his peak in Splatoon 1, he's been at his peak. Like, I guess you could argue that the beginning of Splatoon 2, where the Chargers weren't fully kind of developed yet, and you had, the, like, the armor, the armor spam meta, but even then, it's just, like, he was still really good then, too. Like, it's I don't know his 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 ability to be consistently good all the time. I, I, so DJ, who are you going with? Are you going I, with? I think it's going to be FT Win. I think okay. it, it could very easily be what, and I think it's probably close. But I think I think uh, FT Win's going to do it. Kendall, FT Win. Ooh, I think right. it's going to be close. I think it's going to be close, but I. I... I might have to go with what DJ said about um, their situation, and I think it's gonna be close still. But I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go FT one. Okay. Um, for me, some things that I could take into account is again that national land stage and like that and that those nerves. You know, obviously we don't know what the stage is gonna look like for PAX East. I would actually imagine that it's a, probably a little bit bigger than what they had for E3 because if I remember E3 was kind of in a smallish type of. Um, uh, what's the word like uh, the the vent the it was more like a, a ballroom type of thing or not a ballroom but a, like a uh, it was a theater yeah a theater yeah. yes thank you yeah. there that was the word I was looking for so it was they weren't able to fit in as many people but like PAX East will have a lot more space I would imagine so a potential for a much bigger audience which is always a little bit more intimidating there's more noise that goes along with that right so um, I think of you know Ice who has traditionally been kind of a more reserved person in terms of being public you know people like that historically speaking will have a little bit of difficulties um i do think it will be ftw versus what in the finals assuming they're on the opposite sides of the bracket but i'm gonna have to go with what i love those guys too much i love austin i love tic tac too much um austin being pangit um all the all the ftw guys are great um but it's just i don't know i think i think it comes down to Experience versus practice, because I think the FTW guys are more practice, but I think the what guys are more experienced. So, are you basically saying that they're the Splatoon gods of NA? Is that what you're trying to say <laughs> right um, now? Is that is not, that what you're saying? Not all of them. Like, I definitely wouldn't call Tic Tac a Splatoon <laughs> god of NA. Like, <laughs> like, no, I'm being honest. Like, I, I he's gonna be like, offended. He no, is. <laughs> Historically speaking, you have Fuzzy, Pangit, Power. Like those guys have consistently been up there. Pan- uh, Tic Tac is good and deserves to be on that team. It's just that he doesn't have that same pedigree. He doesn't have sure. that same level of. Yeah. He, he wins BNS with pickups. That's that's his pedigree. So currently, yes, and it's it's a developing <laughs> pedigree, and I think that he will be able to take it and add it to it, and you know, then you might, <clears throat> excuse me, might start becoming, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, might start be getting up there. But mm-hmm. as of right now, he just doesn't have that. Mm-hmm. At the same time, FTW is coming off of a very good hot streak at the moment, and uh, there's no real signs of them slowing down. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. 
True. All right. All right. Um, I think that wraps uh, wait, up. One last thing. Go, by go the way. for it. I, I say this every time that they have one of these things. I really wish that this could have been like top eight goes to packs. Either way of it being lopsided, I really wish that like they did it like top eight goes to packs. Just have like one big thing so it's not just like top four. Obviously, I don't like don't know how much money they would have put into it, but I really wish that all the teams got to go to packs for top eight. It could have been like one big thing and it just showing off more teams just in general. I, I really, really, really wish that. And like at one point in time, they can never get to a point because um, I'm guessing at this point, they're probably not doing anything for um, E3. It's, uh, you never know, but... Um, if we haven't heard anything by now, I get worried about it, but it's I, like... I really wish that they did a top eight. It's so Nintendo, just like, so you never know. You never yeah. know, but yeah, like if they did something like that, it would mean a lot to like the players that obviously got into it. Like even just like, even though you got 4 would you still like, oh, wow, we got to go to PAX. Like we got to do this with like play with our team, meet our teammates. People got to also see the team um, that that made it. They get to see the faces. Um, it's like, oh, wow, like this person plays like Splatoon and they they were on this team and stuff like that. So it, I feel like it would mean more also. But obviously it's still top four, but I, I just really wish that they would like expand on it. Yeah, I agree. I do think having double the amount of teams, even a top eight, would, and having that be at the live portion would make it feel more significant, but it, that's also doubling your expenses. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it, but still, so, it'd be cool. Doubling your expenses and doubling amount of the, the amount of teams whose moms could say you can't go and, and having to deal with that afterward. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, come on. I'm just saying it'd be nice. That's all. Oh, yeah. No question. That'd be sick. <clears throat> It's All a step right. up from last year, but we're still not caught up to EU, basically, is what I'm saying. About that, that's my whole thing. Like, you look at EU, and it's just like, dang, are you serious? Like, What is it? 12 yeah. teams that are going? I think it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, 12. Three in each pool. Yeah, yeah, three in each pool. It's wild. Like, I look at that, and I'm just like, wow. Like, mm -hmm. at least but they're, they're forced by country, you know what <laughs> I mean? They don't get to use their main teams, so... It's also still, true. It's like, like there's always some caveat with everything Nintendo does. Like I mean, at the end of the day, there's like I, even what I'm saying, it's like yo, we got four out, whatever. I got to go to I got to go to France and meet Kiver and all these other people, and like people saw my team playing on like Nintendo stream. Like people saw me live at the LAN event. Like it's just a it's just a cool experience to say and like just to have. Like it's something just cool to be a part of. That's all I'm saying. Like it's just it's just cool. That's really it. I'll stop saying cool. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Cool. Anyway, so cool. Um, <laughs> so moving on here, let's uh, go into a different topic that isn't directly related to tournaments, um, and more of a community topic that kind of somewhat blew up <laughs> a few. I want to say like a week ago. Yeah. Um, the topic of which is of coaching, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and this was something that even FLC, who was our guest a uh, couple, you know, uh, recently on the show, had some thoughts to say about that as well. Even though he's not here with us today. Um, but this idea of coaching, you know, does, does do Splatoon 2 teams need a coach? Should they get a coach? What qualifies as a coach? I mean, there's a lot of different things that we can talk about here. Um, Nine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with you as someone that does have a wealth of knowledge regarding the game and your casting abilities. What are your thoughts on coaching in Splatoon? Do you think more teams should have a coach? I think that any sort of collaborative combination of knowledge is always beneficial, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not directly a coach. So <clears throat> need, probably not. A lot of top teams got where they did without directly having a coach. But there's also the factor that a lot of these top teams came up around the same time. And I know, like, from what I've heard, I'm concluded that, like, 99% of the top players were currently on Squid Squad Spades at some point. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, I think that... You know, there is that element of that knowledge sharing, but I think a coach can be very beneficial if it is the right fit. And that that's important because, you know, there are great coaches even in professional sports that can't do anything uh, with the players that they are. And then there's some that you just find a match and it all works out. Um, so it's important to find a fit and it's important that both sides understand uh, what is expected of them. Perhaps a more, uh, you know, more interesting conversation is what makes a good coach. And that's, you know, you could do an entire podcast on that. Oh, yes, I could. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I think that, you know, I think that coaching, especially for um, a team that maybe is trying to get over the hump. I mean, a coach can't build newcomers into great players, right? That is time and effort 
Yep. That is, there's a, a really good coach of, could. <laughs> the coach. best coach that ever top could. Player, that top player serum. They could Give get. me that, that, top, that top player <laughs> juice, you know? Yeah, that top player juice, baby. Juice. <laughs> Let's go. But there is a there is an aspect of time that has to be put in, and no coach, no coach, no matter how good they are, can overcome that. But I do think that a coach can be invaluable for helping you see the weaknesses in your own game, helping you make adjustments, and then getting you over like that hump maybe and into another level. But um, I think that I think that mid-level teams stand to gain more from a coach than low-level teams mm -hmm. um, because I think that mid-level teams have an awareness and residual knowledge of the game that you have to have in order to really gain benefits from a coach. Whereas low level players are still learning everything, the fundam yeah, the, the fundamental. very fundamentals of the game, and I think until you have those, you aren't really going to gain a lot from the more advanced stuff. Um, even if that advanced stuff is just you know spacing, uh, composition, learning how to turn one v ones into two v ones, moving up as a group, you know things like that. I still think that that's a mid level, um, a more mid level beneficiary than a low level. But that is my base thought on coaching. Okay. And uh, DJ, I, I'm going to preface this with that you potentially might be a little bit biased since you used to have a coach. I used to be um, a coach. And you used to be a coach. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on coaching? Um, well, I got a lot of thoughts. But <laughs> <laughs> Gen I guess general baseline <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> the, I guess the, the biggest point I want to make about like the, the community reaction and like the, like the conversation that was being had is like, T do top players have a responsibility to coach lower players and it's like that's a whole other conversation like <laughs> one i say no like first of all like they have no obligation to do so and mm -hmm. two n a good coach is not necessarily a top player i think FL flc said it best on twitter where it's like mm -hmm. you know a top player most of the, what they do well comes from instinct not yeah. not and, and they don't really know how to explain that in a way that someone who doesn't have those same instincts can really understand so you really need to have somebody who understands what it means to be a coach and how to explain something to someone who doesn't understand the concept you're trying to you know impress upon them right. and and as far as that goes there are very very few people in this community that have that ability like like it's just it's it's a very it's probably a, I think it's a very hard skill to learn how to do and I agree it 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 also requires the person you're coaching to like really be open to really understand like really looking at their st self and like accepting flaws and improving on them and applying things and it's like I don't think the coaching thing is necessarily what we need right now I think <clears throat> like maybe a few coaches here and there could make some teams go you know from you know the the A slash B tier to S tier and in, in if you're gonna talk about team tiers, but I think, you know, something like two teams of a similar level become scrim partners and they're scrimming each other every other day and you know, giving each other feedback. Like one of the best best things that Squid Squad Spades had back in the day was Squid Squad Clubs and Squid Squad uh, Hearts. Like we scrimmed those teams all the time. And constant feedback back and forth and it, it really made spades what they were like you know i don't think I, I think there's very few teams right now that have that like that constant feedback from from an outside source as well as just consistently being able to adapt to you know a fixed situation so i think i think if people are going to be looking for the best way to improve right now and i think that's the way to go Okay, and then Kendall, as someone that mainly plays solo queue these days, what are your thoughts on uh, coaching? <laughs> wow, <laughs> as a solo queue expert, what thoughts could no, you possibly no. have? Oh, I play suck. K Pro. Um, no, I suck. Um, <laughs> but all I was gonna say from like the competitive aspect, like even like playing, you know, like Splatoon one with like certain teams. Um, a lot of things that one of the biggest things that I feel like there's just a lot of resources that are on like tapped that a lot of people don't think about doing. Um. Almost every person's VODs in this community, nobody like nobody has them locked behind a paywall. Um, all the tournaments you can rewatch on like YouTube. And I feel like a lot of teams when it comes to like if you're like trying to learn how to be an individual good as an individual player, like you can go to like a lot of people's streams and like watch or even like just like sub to Kiver, sub to dude. He has like certain incentives of like becoming better as an individual player, but as like growing as a team or like as dj said before i don't know how much like 
really outside of the like yelling at your VOD, not yelling at it, but telling you on your VOD, yo, your your team is overextending here and there over and over and over again. Like you just need to fix this up. Like there are certain uh, like little aspects. I feel like they're after a while, it's just like, all right, I feel like as an initiative, as a team, you need to like watch like VODs and even mm-hmm. just say like somebody like Soren, he has like his, like you can hear their call outs or maybe paying attention to like what they're doing in, in those instances, instead of just trying to like look for somebody to tell me like, yo, I, what do I need to do to get better? Like, what's the initiative that you need to take? And what can you do not to say like copy what they're doing? I'm not saying like, oh, pick every single weapon that they're doing. And then that's really it. But like watching like for like what they did at the situation when you saw that, like, oh, dude, dude went down here. It was a, it was a two V two V four. Like what situation did this team do at this point in time? All right, cool. Like, yo, they backed out. You saw that this person jumped out or you saw that this person didn't try to be like a solo, like God at this point in time. Like maybe those are little things that you can watch and see because they're all there. Like it's, there's thousands of tournaments. Like (laughs) you can go back and watch all of them. So, I mean, you can go back and like, yo, if this is like, yo, what did KP do against like back squids that made them like absolutely destroy them? Or I'm I'm just saying, that's like not saying that's what happened, but like, or what, what, what cause like for the wind, the feed to win to come out of nowhere and start like working well and synergizing well as a team. Like, what are they doing? And watching those VOD, like watching VODs or even just like asking like what's the mindset behind players like but when they're playing with their team and what they did to like synergize. That's really I feel like if a lot more people try to do those little things and then later on being like, all right, yo, what can we do to advance on? We've, we've done all these steps. What can we do to advance on after that? Right. So, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this idea that, that Kendall's kind of. Um, saying here which is basically personal incentive to like on your own go out and watch all this stuff you know go out and seek it be proactive type of thing um relating to this idea of top players and their potential responsibilities to coach or give advice or assistance to um the teams quote unquote below them in in terms of skill level um it is an interesting thing because a lot of the top players will basically say what kendall just said which is like I didn't have anyone to teach me the ropes. I had to go Mm -hmm. out there and sit down, spend my time, seek it out, grind, 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 time, 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 you know, stuff like that, which to be frank is, is true. It's like, there was no infrastructure around for these people to get to where they're at. They had to go out and build it and seek it themselves. Um, at the same, at the same time, now that there are these experiences available and, people that have gone through this process to potentially start building up a set infrastructure. I I do believe that there is some sort of, I don't, I don't, I don't want to necessarily say responsibility, but this idea of to help foster growth of sharing what they've learned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of, you know, facilitate this, this kind of um, relationship here. Um, so I guess for me, I don't think it's necessarily that top players are, by all means, it's not their responsibility. They're not obligated in any shape or form. Um, but I do think it's healthy for them to share their experiences. And for what it's worth, I think quite a few of them do actually do that. Yes. You know, right. you know I don't yes. know. I don't know a <laughs> yes. single, like, granted, yes. just looking at the streamers of, of players from top teams, if you go into their chat and ask them a question, I don't know a single one to be like, no, I'm not going to answer that. Or like, no, I don't want to share that information with you. Like, I legitimately have yo, never seen that happen. Yo, the funniest thing is like, if you even go to like the player like Fuzzy, like, and you went to his streams back when he used to stream more, like mm-hmm. he'd literally go over like, this is where this person, need, like if he's streaming and like he's upset yeah, at the, like, the, the Japanese the, team that he's playing. The, the MS Paint, uh, this is why this is bad. He literally sits I love MS Paint. that, I love L- that. I loved it, it was hilarious. <laughs> he was like, this person freaking should have been here. They weren't here, they didn't hit here, so I had to go here, and then this is what happened. So I got left. Sorry, I didn't do it as monotone as he did it, but like, <laughs> it's, it's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm not gonna lie to you, he gave a lot of valuable information. A lot of like players, even like, dude does it all the time. Sandow does it all the time. A lot of them do it all the time. So I never understood like which players are like unaccessible to like people and like all of them, I think at this point now Pots. do like do videos like Gray does like three hour videos if you want to go sit down and watch those about like what he thinks about certain things. So I feel like people want like somebody to sit down and like not even be tutor, be mommy and daddy and be like, yo, can you please hold my controller and tell me how to play? So I don't know. I think even they, even if they don't actively think that, that's kind of what they're 
asking for in a lot of ways. Um, but like the even the fuzzy stuff that kind of explains what I mean about like you know he's explaining what like from his point of view why it was bad, but you know that player might not understand why he's like this is bad, don't do it. Like I don't <laughs> understand be, why that's bad. Like, yeah, like exactly why why do I have to be here instead of there? Him. Like it, like someone with actual like coaching skills can be like. Well, because you're here, you don't have the angles to help, you know, that, like, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Right. But, you mm-hmm. know, it's just, it's, like, they, they answer the questions to their ability, and some are better at it than others. And, and But, like, I don't think anybody's out there saying, hey, no, you're bad, and I, you're not worth me giving you any feedback. I don't think anybody, anybody does that. I so mean, are there any coaches that you guys could recommend? Nine, are you willing to be a coach? <laughs> Am I willing to be a coach? If someone considers me worthy of being a coach, I would do it to the best of my ability. Sub goal my... incentive. Sub, sub co- goal I'm incentive. coaching nine at SS. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm. I'm. Yeah, he's. Uh, he's helping out Stratosphere get back to our. Oh, oh so that's former... wow. no wonder you listed DJ in your top three coaches. We're biased. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I've I've seen DJ's work firsthand. Um, but uh, are you ready? Are you ready for my like? my my galaxy brain thoughts on all of this and oh, i never used go. that for it but my prepping. thought about all of this is that all of this issue which pops up every three months of the top players versus lower level players is because both sides are equally frustrated with the structure of our current system in splatoon because mm-hmm. and here is why the system is structured so much to the point that now the top players who have worked their butts off to get where they are can now are are currently at the top right and they of course know each other because they grinded themselves up together while raising the bar with Mm -hmm. essentially no resources to do so and they now have each other as a resource to continue going there whereas at the bottom there are still there are a lot more resources than there were before but the structure isn't there as much there's not a clear system of progression to get to the next level outside of maybe finishing better in a weekly event there aren't that it's very difficult to chart progression in Splatoon. And you do have some cases, like you have you know, your Seafood Sorbets or your Luminous Seas, but even even teams like Luminous Sea are made up of Splatoon 1 veterans that saw lots of success with top teams. And that's our like upstart team. So it's mm-hmm. very difficult to do so. So I think that both sides are frustrated because the needs are not being met. And I think that as a result of that, it's created a lot of animosity towards the other side. Maybe not like true, fully animosity. I'm not accusing yeah. either side of like outright attacking, but I think there is legitimate frustration there. And I think, as you were saying, Prodigy, you know, of course, I think that both sides would benefit where the other one's needs being met. And I think that uh, that is where the discussion really needs to head if we want to avoid this conversation for the upteenth time. But with <laughs> that so out of the fun. yeah, but with that out of the way, <laughs> for with the that views. out of the way, <laughs> of course, there is no obligation for top level players. It would be healthy if, for some reason, they selflessly sacrificed all their practice time to help. But it's a hard game. They're working to stay at the top. Mm-hmm. And DJ, you've gone like you've done such a great job of describing like how even top players who are explaining the base concepts might not necessarily be good at coaching. So I think that the, I guess the way to kind of delve into that and really kind of get at the root of the problem is for more people to do as you are doing now, DJ, and really put an emphasis on building the skill set to help newer players improve at the game. Um, Because if you look at, I mean, there, even in something as simple as fitness, there are personal trainers. Personal trainers are not the ones that are winning bodybuilding competitions, and yet they train people who do that. Mm-hmm. Your position coaches might in in football, for instance, American football, probably are not better at the position or never were than the athletes they're coaching. It's important that there's someone who understands and makes their skill set, their business, the one of helping other people improve. And I don't think that that has to be, nor should it be, top players because i think our our top players are very open and accepting like you were saying you hop into anyone's twitch chat ask a question you're probably going to get it answered um they might meme about it when they do it but yeah they might meme about it when they do it but that's you know and i think that even the gatekeeping of knowledge in places like plus one i don't think is intentionally gate kept it's not like they're trying to make sure that no lower level teams could ever possibly access that it's just a closed community that shares knowledge amongst itself. Yep. And I mean, it, 
that's it, none of it's intentionally bad. I do think that there it's a situation where I don't think either side is trying to cause a problem, but that there is a problem nonetheless that needs to be solved. But I don't think it falls squarely at the feet of top players to finish that problem. That's a that community. was a very wordy way to say it. No, I think so. Let me let me try to summarize a little bit briefly. Um, basically, you have two sides, one that's grinded it up and has built up this wealth of knowledge where there was no infrastructure before. Mm-hmm. And then you have this other side that wants to do the same thing. And they know that wealth of knowledge exists, but they don't know how to attain it. And so there's kind of this in-between gap that's kind of missing, I think is what you're basically trying to say, right? There, There is. And to further on to that point, when you guys were pushing the ceiling and pushing the game higher up at the start of the game, there weren't, and I, this is the language I'm going to use, I don't mean this quite literally, there weren't top level teams standing on top of that roof. You know, mm-hmm. you guys were pushing the bar up but now the lower level teams have to catch up to the people who initially rose that bar, which just adds to the frustration. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's like the bar is continually being pushed. So yes, your summary was was quite accurate. So I think what, relating to this discussion here, is would be something along the lines of what the word I used earlier, which is infrastructure, right? Being able to have a more set out resource that kind of describes the ways or means to obtain this knowledge, I think would be a good starting point to try to help bridge these two things. Um, And I think you even then you start to see, or we have at least started to see a little bit more of that concept of like, you know, thoroughly describing or giving, uh, talking about the ways to achieve this type of stuff. So for example, with the recent blow up of tier list for weapons um, over the past few months, Gray came out with like a three hour video <laughs> going over every so single bad. weapon and talking about exactly where he was placing it and why he was placing it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's a super valuable resource for someone that is, again, building the fundamentals, wanting to know yeah. in, this, in this current patch, in this current meta, what does what, what is good. But you still like all we really have is like social media to kind of direct people towards that resource right you have you have word of mouth that's what we have so i honestly think that that might be if someone really wants to tackle this issue i think bridging that gap of having a a a a way to direct people to the right destination for the stuff they're seeking and i think coaches could fill that gap i think coaches uh, are people that have the ability to do research well. I, I think they also need to have good communication skills. I think those two things ultimately are probably two of the most important aspects of being a good coach. Um, so maybe that would be a way for people to who want to get into coaching. Maybe that would be a good way to do that. And I think there's a niche available there that honestly remains untapped as someone that has coached. I mean, I coach Squid Squad Spades. I'm coaching other teams now. I've, I've, I coach my own team more or less. I've pretty much been coaching Splatoon since I got involved with competitive Splatoon. And I've always viewed as my job is to direct them towards a resource and not necessarily being the one of being like, ah, yes, if you're playing Splattershot in this position on Black Belly, you need to go left, not right. Like, that's not, I, that's not for me to decide. You're the player. You decide it. But I want to give you the resources to be able to make that decision. Um, that's good. And actually, to is. follow up on that point, maybe the step that the because i'm always when it comes to situations i'm always like what can the the everyday player do to help with this because like anytime you're making a solution you want to involve as many people as you can maybe what we should do is we should glorify the concept of becoming a coach and just throw a lot of positivity Mm -hmm. behind that idea to get people to go up and and try it i think one of the best things that the splatoon scene has um and i've gotten to see this a lot firsthand is how like how we structure our commentary (laughs) because like it's become a part where like now people are really really happy to try to become a commentator and they're excited to try to do that and that's a hard job to do but because there's been success for some of our commentators and it's a legitimate way to build a brand i think that if we take some of that and that same concept and apply it to coaching more people will be excited to try to become coaches and try to build that skill set and that's an invaluable resource in any community so no. Prodigy, you solved it. You solved it. It took I you like it. <laughs> one summary in three minutes and you solved the whole dang thing. Well, getting along to that uh, summary and this idea of incentive to make this happen, 
should paid coaching be something that more people support? I saw, you know, I couldn't, we can't see how DJ have it set, has it set up. I only saw this on stream. He was, he was sitting there doing, you know, the, the raining money thing <laughs> going on. So I think I know what he, he, his thoughts are on that, but I'll, I'll start with you, Kendall. Should paid coaching be something that's more viewed as a positive and acceptable thing that's worthwhile doing? Yes. Um, in other scenes, but. No, not even but. Okay. Like in other scenes, like you can even go to like the, the smash scene. And obviously, like if you go further down, you'll find somebody that's like in the level or whatever you want to call it. And they're just like, if you sub to my channel, I'll give you a free session. Um, I feel like there's a, a missing part in like the Splatoon section. Like you'll see FLC do it every once in a while where like he'll take a VOD of the past tournament and like he'll look at it, go over it. I feel like if people like if they really want coaching and like somebody was like, you know, like they're like somebody like DJ, obviously. I don't know, DJ, maybe you want to take this idea. And, you know, like if you like sub to my channel, like uh, for like either tier two, I'll coach your, I'll coach your team. And I'll go over like, I'll go over detailed notes of like a VOD review of like what we can do to make your team better. Um, just like getting them in or like subs, just, just a regular sub. Or if, if it's individual, like I'll do, I'll do one session for like whatever one sub each month trying to get like you know people just to come back subs and people like they build a connection with you on top of that i mean and then on top of that you can just be like oh and i'll if if if, if i hit a certain amount of subs i'll do a vibe review of the invitational the open whatever it is if there's an interest i feel like there's there's there are a lot of people interested in it mm -hmm. um and i feel like there's like when nine did it for when he was i don't know if you were commentating i can't remember exactly but you were going over like the sets of i forgot what tournament was the land and people were interested they wanted to watch it um yeah, they wanted to know about VOD reviews VOD when, review wednesdays whenever, those were really yes. popular yeah. whenever flc comes on to shit on everybody there are millions <laughs> of people there like please tell me more please come back yes steady flc please <laughs> fix your internet so that we can actually watch you like there's there's just so many there's just so many people no no but you just, just you just took it from zero to 100 and back no, to zero again man just, no but genuinely Woo! genuinely like like the even flames. when like, i'm watching i'm just like dang, dang like are you are you like are we all really this bad like like are you really just gonna like like it's just the funniest thing ever when they meme about the whole h3 thing but like people genuinely will genuinely like it like kiver did it i i saw when he did it when he was like commentating or like going over like what this team did or like what set like what what they're using how they're synergizing with each other like there are people that want these type of things and if you could find an outlet of those people that want it there are people that are going to want to sub to your channel to get more of that information like in every community they do this it's not just it's not just smash it's probably an overwatch certain people do it like it, it, there is a niche for it and there is a want for it i feel like if somebody just has to figure out how can i get people to like you know sub towards it i think dude has something an incentive a sub incentive i'm not i think, exactly I think sure. he mentioned on his patreon i think it's something is it, is it patreon? patreon it's one of them and I, as I said like there are people that can do it i, I really believe that it just I, it, it, it's work I, I will say that the paid coaching thing is great and <laughs> it's awesome in theory but then when it becomes somebody's just asking people to coach them and giving them 30 bucks and the person has no ability to coach and they're wasting 30 bucks. And then I'm like, all right, I'm never doing that again. Cause I just got totally screwed over. Like it, I mean, like there needs to be some sort of like, if, if the paid coaching thing is going to catch on, I feel like there should, should be some sort of verification I, that they're qualified can, to do that. <laughs> you know what can I mean? I, can I, can I clarify on what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it's going to be like, Say, let's and I'm not I'm not I wouldn't I would never put myself in that situation I would never try to ask somebody for money but that's just me but the people I'm more talking about is like your walkies DJ prodigy FLC as I said before and there are a couple of other like other people that you guys know that could easily do this but do they do it I'm not saying that they're obligated to do it but like you guys know who I'm talking about and they def and there are other players that probably could do the same thing also. So, and I mean, like, you're not going to give it to anybody else. Like, I'm who 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 who's here giving? People can't even give money to a tournament. All right. So, like, <laughs> I, who's really giving thirty dollars to somebody? Like, but I've all, what I'm really saying is, I feel like if it's somebody that they know that like they they can get valuable information from, I'm pretty sure like they would do it. Pretty sure. 
Yeah, I think uh, it's always it's always up to the consumer to decide what they are willing to pay um, to achieve that next level. Oh, I forgot I think, also Shaq. Sorry, Shaq is another one. He he goes over certain things. He actually does a good job. Smart kid, by the way. Um, yeah. Did sorry. his homework in the middle of a set? I'd say he's probably smart. <laughs> um, but I think I think a bigger issue with this right now is, you know, I think 100% the goal should definitely be paid coaching. You want people to be compensated for their good work. But I think we have to have a culture, first off, of where coaching is a competitive environment. Um, where we have enough good coaches to justify it. Because right now, um, and I'm sure that there are, are good coaches out there that I'm not aware of, but right now I think there are, because it hasn't been a skill set that's been actively celebrated and cultivated, precious few people who would make that possible. And I think that in order to get from the from a situation where it's you're just seeking one player's advice, like dude in this case where it's something on his Patreon, Mm -hmm. In order to move from that to make it like an actual market, I think that's what needs to happen is eventually it becomes a market. I think there just have to be more people that are willing to, I guess, go down that path and uh, become that because um, I, I think that it has to be normal. The concept of coaching has to be normalized before paid coaching can even sniff the limelight. Because I think actually, believe it or not, I think it is more likely that we will get paid coaches than paid to enter tournaments catching on because ultimately... Yep. Paying to enter a tournament might get you diddly squat at the end of your day. You might spend $5, whatever it is, lose, lose some rounds, get some experience. But if you take that $20, let's say everyone had to put in $5 or add a couple more bucks, make it $30 and you can pay a coach for, I don't X number of hours worth of coaching, you will get more out of that money. You will get more out of your dollar than you would if you just you did a pay to enter tournament. So I think it has a better chance of catching on if coaching is normalized and is commonplace and seen everywhere. So some caveats to that, I will say that um, I think relating, again, we're, we're approaching this concept from the idea <laughs> of needing to bridge this infrastructure gap between, you know, middle tier teams that are wanting to get better and the top tier teams that don't have the time to sit here and teach everyone the ropes, right? And that coaching is the way to, to bridge that gap. So mm -hmm. under that context, I think that you can get a lot more from an hour of coaching than you can play do from playing an hour in a tournament. However, I'm going to guess that a vast majority of people are going to say, well, that hour of coaching is not nearly as fun as an hour of playing the game. And Oh, it's not I, fun. Being coached is not fun. No, no it's not. No, it's it is not. not. It is, it is, it is an not. experience that you have to go through, though. And if you think that, again as part of that grinding that those top players did not sit there and have other people or themselves not play the game when they wanted to instead just sat there and hyper-analyzed all their mistakes to figure out what they were doing wrong. They went through that process. Everyone goes through that process. So it's something that I think people need to understand that you know coaching isn't just like, ah, yes, make me better. You show up and be like, ah, Mr. Teacher, Mr. Coach, here, here's, here's an apple, please make me better. It's just like... Okay, but right, like here's I'm some gonna, pro I'm, player juice. I'm gonna like yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> doesn't work that way. It's more like all right, <laughs> yep. here here's here's my yardstick. I'm smacking it on the chalkboard. We're gonna do your multiplication <laughs> drills. And we're gonna start now. Go 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 go. And like it's it's the blunt honest truth that you have mm -hmm. to accept a lot of the times. So, yeah. can I add a side point before you continue? Yes, go ahead. The other part of it that people don't realize is the coach doesn't magically make you better. You still have to do the work. The, yeah, the coach exactly, just points yeah. you in the direction you need to go. Yep. That's bullcrap. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 100%. Yes. Like, I just realized I didn't sound sarcastic enough when I said that. <laughs> That's um, bullcrap. <laughs> yeah. So um, to kind of wrap up this, this thought, because we have been talking about this for close to 30 minutes now. Um, it's a good topic, I, I, man. It is a really good topic. And I'm, I'm topic. glad. I'm, we could have done I'm a whole glad. episode on this. Yeah, yeah. I'm honestly like the chat's been really, really liking it. Um, so it's I'm really glad that spent so much time on it but to to move on to some other stuff i just want to wrap up by saying that i think coaching could we've talked about this before of this idea that people don't like investing money into a tournament people don't view it as a worthwhile thing doing um and that money in general is very tough to <clears throat> secure from a lot of teams in splatoon um, a lot of teams are not willing to to put money forward um, for various reasons 
some I think are valid and some are probably not valid in my opinion. But I think that coaching might be a way to kind of start bridging that gap to get people more comfortable with the idea of paying for a service um, and where they can finally start seeing a an improvement or a an, an actual outcome happening from actually using money, whether that being from coaching, then that coaching then goes, okay, now let's actually enter a tournament where we pay to, sh- to show how much we've improved because of our coaching. You know, let's, you know, I'm, we're having more fun playing the game because we're doing better. We're winning more. Let's go to lands now. Like, I think there could really be kind of, you know, a, a really strong growth there that I hope that, you know, might potentially be an answer for some of the stuff we've been struggling with as a community. Anyway, moving on to some viewer questions before we wrap up. We got, actually got, several yeah. of them um today yes. and quite a yeah, few like way more than i expected yeah and we got a, quite a few good ones so i'm gonna pull some up here let me tweet Get my phone out too yeah yes um way so expected. this one i'll start off with because it is related to this coaching kind of topic and it would be a nice segue the one tweets saying what are the top three problems mid to high level teams and na have in our opinion um dj i'll start with you well hold on wait can i clarify is this like problems they are facing within the scene or problems in their game i uh my guess would be in the context of of gameplay okay just clarifying go ahead um yeah like there's a definitely skill gap between you know the top like i'd say there's like a top two team like there's a top two team tier in na and then a top like 18 tier in na and then everybody else has there's like a huge gap below that and i think that the coaching thing would help a lot with that Mm -hmm. um i think the other another big problem is there's just a lack of (sighs) there's a lack of i I don't want it the word that comes to my, my mind is work ethic but i don't think that quite fits what i'm talking about because like people don't really People in NA, more than any other area, play to play, not play to win. Um, they, they play because they want to, you know, they, they like playing Inkbrush and solo, so I'm playing Inkbrush in our competitive games, that kind of stuff. Um, and it, that's not really the way to move forward. I'm not saying play the meta, but like understand why you're picking that weapon and make it good because of that. And then... Number three would probably be, I don't know, it's like the mid to high, maybe just the fact that they're only scrimming themselves most of the time, like, you know, scrim EU. If you, if you use so much better right now, scrim them, that kind of stuff. Uh, something that simple, I guess. It's, it's not a clear third. I think the top two are very much like the biggest problems right now. Okay. Nine? Uh, can I just read Tic Tacs? Because I agree with most of them. <laughs> Go yeah, for it. The same thing. Sure. Um, so Tic Tac says, actually, you know what? I'm just going to read Tic Tac's list and then <laughs> yep. so, not enough analysis. People just want to play and improve. I think, uh, you know, I obviously can't speak to every North American team, but I think there are, to DJ's point, with the lack of work ethic and that not being quite, quite the right word, the hours are being put in by a lot of players and a lot of teams. I think that there needs to be more and this is not strictly even just NA, but I think more time being put into exploring ways of training and ways of, of practicing and different styles going along with that. Just like how in traditional sports, you do drills for hours yeah. to then do 30 minutes of seven on seven, you know, in American football. And I think that that's, you know, something that needs to be explored there. Um, and again, uh, let's see. He says, people don't understand that you work together towards the same win condition, that you split roles between teammates to achieve that. And then he says, uh, people just want solo queue quads and don't play to win. So um, I can say I can speak less to the last two. But uh, the second issue I would say from a gameplay perspective, uh, and, and Kyo said this very uh, eloquently when he said, uh, they don't move, they are answer <laughs> solved. Uh, I think that there is a sort of... You know, when I think of playing against the top, top teams, and I've been fortunate enough to, through, you know, different scrims or connections I have, get to play against players like that. It's like you're always fighting eight people instead of four. There is a general willingness to always, every second, be doing something, whether it's communicating, 
whether it's moving, something is always, always getting done. Mm. And I think that if you work to eliminate passiveness from your play and refine that, I think you will be amazed at how much better you get. It's like in fighting games, it's like it, the term is eliminating dead frames, where it's just like you may save it. three frames, but three frames in one move, two frames in another move, another, you've saved a tenth of a second on whatever it was you're trying to do. And that could just be an up throw up air. And you mm-hmm. could save that much. So I think just those small refinements. And I think that, I guess that's the last point really too, is just being willing to look as deep as you can into whatever it is you do. Something you may think that you're pretty good at. Maybe it's maybe you're just really confident in your aim. Did you really hit every shot you could? Did every bullet that you aimed at that person hit them? Did you make the fall off happen? Just really being willing to look as deep as possible and refine the very fundamentals. I think that sometimes mid-level teams are searching for a golden snitch of sorts that will really open it up. And I think there's a lot of very fundamental aspects that mid-level teams may be overlooking even on an individual level that I think would yeah. really elevate them. So just back to basics, always. Okay. And then, uh, Kendall, you said you kind of agreed what Tic Tac said to those three things. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. But what I was going to say is um, I feel like there's uh, also the biggest problem. One of the biggest problems is like, and you, obviously people pointed out yesterday. They pointed out in a lot of tournaments um, with a lot of like lower-level teams and even mid-level teams is a lack of understanding of um, – weapons and team comps and it's not saying that your ink brush is bad it's saying that that might not have been the best pick for the map and the mode combo that you picked it on and some people get, like get put off so badly by it they're just like no i'm just gonna i'm just gonna run it i don't care i don't care i don't care i don't care um and it's not understanding why you're running it and like what you're supposed to be doing with your team that will help it help them be effective and win at the same time mm-hmm. um that's a whole nother discussion about like team synergy or like why you're running two back lines or why you're running no backline comp, like why you're doing it. Does mm-hmm. it even make sense? Like, do you even know the team that you're going against? And like, are you thinking about like, even like has, was there any thought of what you're doing when you're going into the match? Um, another thing is not understanding that this game's a team game. Um, too many people want to be Michael Jordan. And <laughs> Too many like, Kyo's out there. Too Let many Kyo's. Kyo is the problem. God, <laughs> dang it, Kyo. your fault, Kyo. Let me not even say Kyo, but everybody wants to be like, and it's not their fault, obviously. Everybody wants to be Kiver. Everybody wants to like do parkour. Everyone wants to be a Rashi's towers. hammer. Exactly. Everybody wants to be a Rashi's hammer. And not understanding that like sometimes just being the simple player can take your team even further. Like it's obviously it's not solo queue. So yeah, maybe you have to play a little bit boring just so your team can actually like get further and understand like, all right, maybe I shouldn't go flank off and not tell my team that like, I'm going to pop my special, my armor when I'm, when there's three down or whatever, like have whatever you it is. Ever wa- have any of you ever watched Tic Tac's player cam? He's the single most boring player to ever follow along, <laughs> but he yes. wins everything. <laughs> he throws bomb. He uses armor when team needs it. He hits the shots. He makes the two V ones. And that is because he understands it. Yep, it's I. I love it. Yeah. I love the the first thing I tell people when I'm like teaching them how to vod review themselves is, like I'll 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 start the I'll start the game and if they like die or something I'll just pause it and be like all right why was that bad, and if they can't answer me in like five seconds it's like all right you are doing something wrong, if you don't know if you don't know why you made a mistake right there you are not in the right mindset in that moment. Mm-hmm. Or if you couldn't even identify the mistake in the first place. Yeah, like if, if you can't identify the mistake, you are not thinking, you, there was no thought going into what you did there. And if you right. can't think like that, then you're, you're very clearly just playing to, just, you're just playing the game. You're not like improving at the game. Yeah. So we got some more good questions. So I'm just going to add my quick three things and we'll move on from here. I think uh, sometimes uh, teams don't want to go back and look at their fundamentals again, um, such as thinking about map flow and weapons to use on certain map mode combinations, stuff that no one wants to do because it's a lot of time, a lot of work, but mm-hmm. it is part of the fundamentals of the game. I think too many people are don't want to go back and do that. Um, I think the uh, idea of playing for fun versus playing what is strong is what a lot of teams struggle with uh, I, I is, and there's nothing 
wrong with that. Nope. But if your goal is to win, but then turn around and play what is fun, knowing it's not as strong, you're putting yourself at an inherent disadvantage. So, you know, you got to kind of realize that. And there's something that I always do when I always coach teams. And the very first thing that I always ask them as a team is individually, what are each of your goals? In nine times out of 10, every single member of the team tells me a completely different goal. And I in turn respond and say, well, if you guys all have different individual goals, how do you think you should expect to win coming together as a team, all trying to achieve different things? You need a singular, cohesive determination driving all of you that all of you can get behind. Mm -hmm. And just going back to those basics, those three things, instantly you will start seeing more success. Instantly. It's not even a matter of gameplay. It is literally just a matter of mindset and approach. So those would be my three things. I would say that's a strange approach. Okay. Bad um, joke, God. <laughs> that's um, all the time we have for today. Hey, joke. Right. <laughs> Those cancel, we're done. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so there's, there's a couple questions that are somewhat related, so I'm going to kind of combine them. Um, I'm going to read them out individually first. Uh, Bitmap asks, how can this scene nurture and foster new talent slash teams that are up and coming, but retain talent from the very top at the same time? That is a topic that we've kind of somewhat touched on today. But adding on to that, uh, Roxy tweets, as captain of a fairly new team, what should you and your teammates be focusing on in tournament? Should it be focusing on winning the whole tournament or learn from the experience? And again, I think that these two tweets are kind of related. Um, DJ, again, I'll start with you as someone that's been very experienced with um, not only being around and competing for a very long time, but having made several different teams over the course of your time competing. Uh, what would you say to these uh, to these questions? Um, I mean, I feel like the first question we pretty much covered in the coaching yeah. slash content slash whatever else thing. Um, the, 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 the new team question, uh, hang on, let me read it again. Should we be focusing on winning the whole tournament or learn from the experience? Um, is it too much to ask for both? First of all, mm -hmm. and second of all, th you got to go into it. Like I think a lot of people don't realize if you should be going into a, into it where being eliminated from the tournament is not the end of the tournament for you because mm -hmm. you should immediately be thinking, all right, we need to figure out why we lost there. <laughs> like right. we need a VOD review. Let's get into a VC. Like if if you can't do it immediately after, do it that night or the next day like don't wait because the longer you wait the less fresh it is in your mind so i think like fairly new teams need to start thinking that way where it's like all right i'm gonna play this tournament but I, that's not the end of my day you know mm -hmm. so i think that i think that would be the biggest the, the quickest and biggest thing i would say to a team struggling with that okay uh kendall how about you i feel like we said everything already but uh coming into a tournament I, I i don't know i feel like especially if you're new it's a hard thing to grasp uh like what dj said already is just i don't know there's just the aspect of when you're coming into a new a tournament new fresh as a team get ready to get spanked <laughs> but like it, it's it's just the realization of it like the first time i remember splat one going on a just a little tangent splat one first time playing um chimera ever we got smacked but like what do we do after that was like all right let's talk about how can we go into next time where it will be a, maybe a little bit better maybe we'll hold the zone for maybe 30 more seconds <laughs> but it'll be maybe a little bit of a difference than the last time um but no in, in all seriousness it should be like maybe what can you do as individually looking towards the next tournament how you can actually change um the aspect of maybe like as a player or even as a as a coach what can you do to like help your team maybe to get through that even or like have them understand that it's going to be hard in the beginning but as you like weather the storm it can get a little bit better and like taking little steps as it goes along not trying yep. to just like overshoot and be like yo we're freaking gonna go to like we're gonna go to PAX we're gonna win this whole thing that's how you get burnt out that's how you just like yo like we just got destroyed over and over and over again so taking steps realizing like yo what can we do in this set to make it better maybe so we don't go zero the whole entire tournament um what can we do individually to, as a coach what can i tell my team teammates individually or not a coach as a captain what can i tell my teammates to do individually to move on forward from that so mm -hmm. that's my, my god and uh nine 
Um, so you guys answered Rock Seed's question pretty well. So I'll go ahead and speak a little more towards bitmaps. Uh, scene, how can the scene nurture and foster new talent teams that are up and coming but retain talent from the very top at the same time? I think that as we talked about this, this like coaching conglomerate confederation, something like that, whatever, whatever we want to call the, this. The CCF, the coaching, the coaching well, empire. The new coaching, that's the good, okay. We're marketing the, the that NCE. right now. <laughs> but I, I think on a serious note, calling attention to the fact that it is a skill set and that the analysis side and conveying that is a skill set that needs to be worked on. I think that even if people don't become coaches, telling people that that is a separate skill set that needs to be addressed, I think will help everybody. And again, yes. to go back to commentary, people can see very easily like commentary, you can be a great player and not be a great commentator. Now with that, it's there's the the whole aspect of uh, your vernacular, the way that you communicate, charisma, working with a team or with a partner. Ooh, vernacular. Those are, vernacular. <laughs> but those are all skill sets Fancy. that you have to convey. And see, that's something that a lot of people see and they're like, oh, well, duh, of course, it's commentary, blah, blah, blah. But I think that we don't do a good enough job of conveying the fact that coaching is a separate skill set. And I think mm. telling people that will incentivize and inspire people to go and improve that and maybe ask questions instead of how do I get better? How do I learn better? That's I phrase that so horribly, but how do okay. I learn how to review VODs better? What do you look for when you review VODs? If those right. are the questions that everyone is asking, I think that with some help from top players, um, forcing them to ask that question. The, okay, so this is off topic, but I think the greatest thing that top players have is not their game knowledge; it is their platform. I mm -hmm. think that if like if if dude and Kiver and like Penga, I'm just thinking of like people with big followings, tweeted something of saying instead of asking how do you get better, ask how do I analyze. Immediately, people would start doing it. Like, mm -hmm. and I think that if that is the focus that is made. I think that that will help. If you have people take it from a more academic standpoint, that will help. Now, ultimately, this is going only going to help the people who are still willing to help themselves. But I think, honestly, those are the people that we should be focusing on. You know, you can't save everybody. You can't yeah. make everybody want to no. be better. But just kind of redirecting that conversation, I think, will help them a lot. It will help nurture them. And it will, more importantly, give them the tools to help themselves. Okay. Um, going along with that, I think, uh, just as an example of, of Melee, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of Mango and I love watching his, his streams. And when he does talk about his gameplay, he literally will talk about, you know, frame perfect stuff. He'll talk about the various different options, the various different DI, DIs that he can do directional inputs from getting out of combos, stuff like that. And it's not just because he just played a bunch. It's because as the smash <laughs> scene calls it, he's lab. He's literally gone in and labbed and figured out. U2 King is like, you know, the guy that literally went in frame by frame analysis of the entire melee game of every character and everything like that. Like these people go in and they actually analyze things to give themselves rational evidence based thought to improve their outcome. Um, so I think that is a very good thing. And kind of merging that with to DJ's thing is I, I, I use this thing where I describe it as um, you, you can spend a lot of time playing this game. Like a lot of, you know, the really good teams like FTW, for example, has some of the younger, you know, competitive players um, that maybe are still in high school and stuff like that just have a bunch of free time versus someone like me that's like 27, I'm married, I'm in grad school, but I still try to, you know, play the game. But, you know, even though they may have double, triple the hours, they may have lapped me five times in solo queue, you know, or my, my, the level in game and stuff like that. <laughs> Every single time I sit down and play this game, I'm trying to put in quality hours not just quantity, I'm not just sitting there playing. Every single minute that I'm playing, I'm trying to get something out of it, right? Um, and that is something that I have to do in order to keep up, because I don't have the same amount of time. So I would say when you enter a tournament, what you should really be trying to get out of it is one, yeah, of course to win. Everyone, you want to have a winner's mentality. You want to be like, all right, this is it. This is the time where everyone's going to learn our name. No one's going to see this coming. We're going to come in and destroy everyone, all right? Everyone should kind of have like that mentality. Um, but then when it doesn't happen because being realistic it won't happen very 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 rare for that to happen <laughs> which is i know paradoxical after what i just said but that's again like that's what you want to be doing is then you got to take a step back and be like okay why didn't that work let's analyze it let's think about it let's 
make it so that time that we just put in wasn't worthless because the only way it becomes worthless is if you don't think about it ever again. So um, I think we got time for maybe one more question. We'll do this one um, a very a little bit more lighthearted and not as in, in depth. Okay. Um, well, this one is a little bit more specific, but I do kind of like it because of recent meta um, stuff. What do you think of using baller for jumps and clam blitz? Is it still the most optimal strategy? Oh, yeah, this is good. I think this is a nice question to kind of wrap things up because <sighs> it's not nearly as in depth. But I think um, I'll go ahead and start because I haven't started off a single topic today. <laughs> I think that in um, coordinated team comps, like uh, like actually playing as a team, I think that it is still viable, but I wouldn't actually call it the best. I never actually viewed it as the best. The issue, the biggest issue with baller and jumps is that you're very, very, very susceptible to full wiping afterwards and giving up complete map control. Mm -hmm. And that's always been the issue. And Clan Blitz, in a way, is a lot like Splat Zones or a lot like Turf War, where you want to have control of the most of the map because that gives you Clam spawns, which leads to points. Um, I think what we're seeing now, especially with some of the new weapons, with um, we're starting to see more kind of chip stuff. Like, you know, you can combine Booyah Bombs with missiles to really push people away from the basket, allowing, you know, a free entry in. And obviously, Bubbles have always still been a thing. Um, Stingray on certain maps is becoming more of a thing. Um, I think that baller jumps are still strong, but I don't think they are optimal. In solo queue, that may not be the case, though. So, Kendall, with solo queue, what do you think is, is our baller jumps? <laughs> Kendall, you, <laughs> you Kendall talked queue. about solo queue this whole you entire become, time. Kendall, you have become what? the solo queue expert. That is your hey, No, man. no, I suck. I suck legitimately. He does, but he's a turf expert, expert though. He's a yes, you you so, stream so much solo queue. I was, though. I was ta we've been talking about competitive the whole time. I still watch it, guys. I don't sit yeah, here. I, and I, 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 I've it. valid your input on. You know, I've, no, I, no, 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 no. I, I was no, going to no, say no. that. I was going to say that. I watched Sendow's video of him saying that like there are other options besides that. You should probably go check out his video because it was actually really good. I don't. I didn't watch the whole thing, but it it, it was actually really good. Um. But from from a solo aspect, it, it never works. Just give up. Like majority of the time, your team's never gonna follow up, follow up to do it. So I mean, why try? Just literally just the whole entire time, literally just pray, and then almost, most likely, what's gonna happen is you're gonna sit there contemplating life the whole entire time while you ballered in and nobody did anything. But what's gonna happen is a brush is gonna come right behind and just throw it right in, and then give them an extra power clam. So remember, don't give your team an extra power clam. And run in and throw a, throw a, throw the power climb at the at the at the basket. But in all seriousness, no. Like I feel like with like watching how Clan Blitz has developed and how things have changed over. I not really changed. I mean, people still do the baller jumps like we saw yesterday. With pretty sure, uh, what was it? What did it on um, uh, Albacore against um, Element R? Um, with like what they threw in like four of them or three of them. I can't remember exactly, but. Um, there are multiple options and multiple ways of doing it. And uh, I feel like you'll see in certain instances where it doesn't work and like there's no follow up. Like you'll see some teams, like as you said before, like they, they'll get wiped. Like there's other safer options depending on the map mode and co combo. So obviously, as you said before, with Tent Umbrella, I, I literally, when you go against a good Tent Umbrella, I, I, I'll say this going against Sendow's Tent Umbrella, because I've never obviously played it in a competition, but going against it in like solo queue is absolutely one of the, also keen. It's absolutely one of the most annoying things I've ever seen in my whole life. So I can, I can only imagine how bad it is in competitive because watching somebody that you can't hit from the front or the back, just push in with bubbles at the same time. And while you have another team being coordinated and just like literally hammering you on with like clamps and, and, and power clamps, there's other options, obviously, and there's more effective ways of getting things done. So, yeah, that's just my point. Yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and, and toss mine in. Uh, the biggest, I think, uh, you know, Prodigy laid it out perfectly. You oftentimes go three or four down as a result of it. And it just takes entirely too long to set up. Because what if, you know, it, it might be that the wrong person has the football. Let's say that your, your Ken Sedulis is the one that builds the football, but they don't have baller yet. Well, they can't really safely go around and try to build baller because now everyone can see them. They have to pass that off. Then they have to go back. Then they still have to get the ball to the goal. And that can take a long time too. So I think it is still viable, of course, in the sense that you still need the ability to do that. Let's say that it's overtime and you need to end a game. Let's say that you need one power clam and like 
two two clams or something like that. You need to have that potential and that ability. And Baller's strong even without the context of clam blitz. So I mean, you're you're still going to see him there. But yeah. I agree. The fundamentals, just making sure you have lots of clams, and then finding ways to go in, create space for yourself, getting picks, overloading one side. I mean, there's there's so many ways to do it that if any team relies on just one simple strategy, it's going to get shut down by the better teams. And I think we see that. I think, you know, teams have slowly started to learn and the teams that are really good at clam blitz um, just have a dominance over the mode. So, yeah. Okay. And DJ? Uh, my point's similar, but it's mostly just that it's it's you got to think of it as a play in the playbook, not as a strategy to win the game Ooh, for yourself. Oh, that's it's so not, good. It's not that's a win so condition, good. but like if if you think about it like this, you like the the later in the game it is, the more valuable it is. The more clams you have, the more valuable it is, and mm-hmm. the the worse they are at stopping the baller, the more valuable it is. Like, and the more map control you have, the more valuable it is. It's like. If, if enough of those boxes are checked, then you're like, all right, yeah, let's go for the baller play. Or right. you can be like, all right, make them think we're going for the baller play, and then we're going to push this side, that kind of stuff. And, you know, if, if, you're, if you have, like, four clams in your, in, in your back pocket and full map control and there's five seconds left to go, there's no reason not to do the baller play, you know what I mean? So it's just think about it like that. Like, it, 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 are you going for the mix-up? Like, it, this, is, this is the play you can do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's generally worth running the baller just because you want to have the option of being able to do the baller push. I guess is another thing to say too. See, so guys, look at how look at how this simple question was answered so analytically and gave entirely new perspective. Consider coaching today. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, man. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that is it for us today. It's been a solid hour and fifty minutes, actually. So yeah. you know, we had quite a good discussion today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging out. Um, interacting in the chat. Appreciate all of you. And uh, Nine, once again, for, for joining us. I greatly appreciate that as well. Thank you for having me again. And uh, hopefully we'll have more of you in the future. But uh, yeah, I think that is it for this GSM live show. And uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Hashtag go to Beacon, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hashtag go to Beacon. Go to Beacon. <laughs>